Chapter 9 For mine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Wedding days bring visions of flowers, romance, joy, and hopes. But weddings have a way of turning into marriages. This is certainly not an attack on the institution of marriage, but when a marriage becomes an institution, the flowers, romance, joy, trust, and hope die. Emotional distance with decreased trust and decreased communication become the norm. It is a centuries-old fashion to blame the institution of marriage itself for the problem, but as is so often the case with man as judge, the judge is the guilty party. It is not the rule of marriage that is the problem, but it is rather ruling the marriage by the individual parties. Self-centeredness and lust for power are the unseen giants which destroy relationship. Self-centeredness and lust for power are the unseen giants which negate the second greatest commandment, love thy neighbor as thyself. And lust for power and self-centeredness permeate all of mankind, for man's fallen nature comes from a fallen god, not creator god, but creature god, Satan. And the goal of creature god and his giants is to destroy relationship, not just with man to man, but with God to man, and to negate the greatest commandment, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. How can I love God with all my heart, soul, and mind when my mind is set on me and my desires? Jesus defined adultery not just as a physical act, but by a heart meditating on another person for personal selfish use. It is no different with my relationship with God. When the meditation of my heart is on me, and my love for me, and my lust for me, another God is before me, and I have created for myself an idol. It has become fashionable to state, my God is a God of love. Interpreted, this means the God I have created does not judge my selfishness and ignores any wrongdoing on my part. But mankind does not have the right or ability to state, let us make God in our image. A God made by man does not raise man up, but pulls him down. Whether the God be stone, wood, or flesh, or an imagined friend, the sentiment of a God of love is often used in response to a mention of God's law. The belief has become that Jesus' purpose is not to save me from my sin, but to save me from the law. Yet this same Jesus, when speaking of love, stated in John 15, 9-10, Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Paul stated in Romans 13.10 that love is the fulfillment of the law, because love does no wrong to a neighbor. If my heart is filled with me, my behaviors will be about me and must result in wrong to my neighbor. When I keep God's commandments, I abide in his love, not when I think he loves me or I feel love toward another person. Biblically defined, love involves God's law and commandments. They cannot be separated. Man cannot love apart from God, because God is love. Man cannot love apart from God's law, because man is man, and will act accordingly. If man is a law unto himself, tyranny will result. Not just political tyranny, but personal tyranny. When I am king, all will suffer under my kingship. When I, as an individual, make the laws that I and others are to live by, those laws will benefit me. The resulting strife is what most of us know simply as life, and it not abundant. Mine is the kingdom will be the mindset and behaviors I have when I do not keep God's commandments. My law is not love, but the laws of God are. Meditation is simply applying the law of the king to my heart. It is listening to the commands of the king. It is the action I take to give God the rightful place of king in the kingdom of God. Only the power of the king's commandments, with his life in me agreeing with those commandments, can rule my rebellious soul. This is why Jesus' promise of the Holy Spirit was linked to keeping his commandments. 
In John 14, 15 through 17, we read, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him. But you know him, because he abides with you and will be in you. Notice the main points, all connected, loving Jesus, keeping his commandments, and the promise of the Holy Spirit. My double-minded soul, listening to self, will disagree with God and fight against the Holy Spirit within me. Which is why the Bible, directed and inspired by the Holy Spirit, continually focuses on the importance of the Word. Phrases such as, Wash by the water of the Word, In the beginning was the Word, The Word was God, Long for the true milk of the Word to grow thereby, The Word of the Lord came, The Word of His power, Your Word is truth, Preach the word, the word of God is living, the word implanted which is able to save your souls, abound in scripture. And the word of God is not just ordinary words. It possesses a power all its own. Hebrews 4.12 states, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God's word has a power to affect the existence, soul, and spirit of mankind, not as normal spoken words, but with a miraculous, non-naturalistic power, which is not quantifiable on cause-effect basis. It is living. It is active. It is God. The exhortation to have my life be a life of the word comes with a very serious problem. God's word and ways are foreign to my life. My natural life, my flesh, is in rebellion towards God. I think humanly, and I react humanly. Humanly is not godly. To agree with God, my very nature must be changed. My soul does not naturally agree with God, and it is powerless to change and really does not want to change. My nature must have a new nature. With this thought, the new birth makes sense. A new life must replace my natural life, but it must be a life that agrees with God, and the only life which will do that is God's life itself. So, God gives me a new spirit, His spirit. God's spirit within me agrees with God's word. His life in me creates a new birth. Scripture literally says, I am a new creation. This new creation is a unique individual. It is a mixture of God and man. It still looks like me, and my personness, personality, is still me. But its rebellious nature has changed. I am now not the human creature I was. I am now in Christ, and Christ is in me. I am no longer a natural man. I have become a supernatural man. No longer homo sapiens, but theo homo. And as a supernatural man, I can now agree with God. The very life of God living in me agrees with God for me. I am granted righteousness. I have become right with God. And as I now have a nature that agrees with God, I can agree with his word. True fellowship with God is agreement with his word. Amos 3.3 states that we do not have fellowship with those with whom we disagree. 1 John 2 verse 3 states that coming to know God is keeping, Greek tereo, his commandments. Again, we do not have fellowship with those with whom we disagree. This has everything to do with the way to true Christian fellowship. True Christian fellowship is not agreeing with one another. It is each Christian agreeing with God's word. Our theologies are often human attempts to coerce God into agreement with man's ideas of God. Our denominations are human efforts to coerce other men into agreement with man's ideas of God, and our feeble, faithless, and loveless attempts to cross denominational or religious lines are usually nothing more than human flailing meant to correct and cover divisions which our lust for power and control has created. And that lust for power and control is the fertile ground for the fruit of organized religion, the common ground between Catholic, 
Protestant, non-denominational denominations, Muslims, or cults. Fruit in Christendom is most commonly defined with such phrases as, Our numbers are growing. We've had hundreds say the sinner's prayer. We need a new sanctuary, education building, gymnasium, or take a look at all our programs. But fruit is governed by laws, laws that God put into effect as early as creation. Fruit always comes from planting seed, and the seed always produces like kind. God put forth these laws when he created the earth. Genesis 1, 24-25 states, Then God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so. God made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind. And God saw that it was good. All that God created were to reproduce after their kind. Jesus stated in Matthew 7 that grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes or figs gathered from thistles. Paul tells us in Galatians 6 that a man reaps what he sows. God created the laws of genetics. They cannot be changed. Scientists manipulate genetic material and genetic traits, but they must follow the laws of genetics which God commanded. A seed always produces after its kind. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. My life is to bear the fruit of the vine. The meditation of my heart produces fruit, and it always produces in like kind. One may think this sounds like, if you just wish hard enough, your dreams come true. But there are serious implications in the planting of wrong seeds. Meditations produce fruit in like kind, because they become part of a belief system which powers behavior. Meditation is not fantasy becoming reality, my dreams coming true. Let me give you an example. I have found that most men who are having a problem with sexual lust have a deeper problem with loneliness. The imaginations and desire for acceptance turn into imaginations and addictions to sexual lust. No five-year-old boy answers, when asked what he wants to be when he grows up, a serial rapist and killer. But later, that five-year-old hurting heart with its 50-year-old body will do almost anything to alleviate that pain. And it began with dreams, imaginations, and meditations. It continues and grows with pornography and prostitution. And it eternally lives with the spiral of spousal and child abuse, manipulation, addiction, adultery, and the hollow scream of pain, as endless as the eternal death in which it lives, is then visited on the next generation of victims and begins to hunt anew for its own victims. Dreams of fulfilling relationships come true in the form of insatiable selfishness. A woman may do the same thing by dreaming about being the object of attention of others and becomes that by dressing in a provocative and lewd fashion. But, as many have found out, once the attention has worn off, she will no longer be an object of attention, but merely an object. Simply dreaming about being a great sports figure or musician without the reality of hard work will only plant the fruit of disappointment, bitterness, and decreased motivation. Meditation on money and power is the seed which produces the fruit of a sense of entitlement, discontent, and rebellion. The seeds of selfishness, self-gratifying meditations, produce fruit precisely after their kind. A self-centered, self-deifying personality. A God who endangers self and all others. A God in need of a God. A God in need of a Savior. Imaginations do not become reality. Small imaginations become greater imaginations. And here we must add that there is also a self-centered, self-deifying institution. The organized church with its dreams, imaginations, and meditations has dressed itself in a provocative and lewd fashion with worldly counsel, teaching, programs, and music. Meditation on money and power has produced a sense of entitlement, discontent, and rebellion against God's word. The seeds of man-centered, number-centered, and church-growth-centered programs, no matter how we whitewash them with the name of Jesus, produce a fruit which is anti-Christ and glorifying to the numbers of man. 
God has spoken through his Son. He has very clearly defined how his disciples are to produce fruit. He has very clearly defined how his disciples are to give glory to the Father in their production of that fruit. Jesus states in John 15, 7 through 8, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Jesus gives us a pattern here to production of fruit, his way. If you abide in me is called a relationship. There is not one speck of religion in this statement. Religion lives in a church building. Relationship lives in oneself. The temple of God is not an organization or an institution. It is the individual where the Holy Spirit dwells. 1 Corinthians 3.16 The word abide in the vernacular would be live. We are to live in Christ while on our jobs, at home, waking, sleeping, breathing. I'm afraid we've missed the point of it all. It's not buildings, programs, or organizations, and it certainly is not the glorious church. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 6.16, Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Do not think that this is the only statement to this effect. This idea permeates scripture. From the creation and early walks in the Garden of Eden, to Emmanuel, God with us, to the outcry and revelation of the Spirit and the Bride who say, Come, the goal of oneness with man, of man living in God and God and man, has remained the same. And through this relationship, God has said he will produce his fruit. The next requirement Jesus mentions, which must be present to produce fruit, which is glorifying to the Father, is my words abide in you. We have just spoken of the word abide as meaning to live. We are to live in Messiah, so also his word to live in us. Again, To live in is not a flippant, casual walk through an area so familiar to our knowledge that there is no knowledge. This is not a casual reading of the word. This is not morning devotionals. This is not reading and forgetting. This is meditation. Meditation to the point that the word of God fuses with one's life. His thoughts become my thoughts, and his ways become my ways. It is deep relationship with the word written and incarnate. It is a deliberate, planned change of one's belief system. It is the subject of this book. Perhaps one of the best ways to think of this is to use Jesus' analogy of a field in Mark 4, 18 and 19. And others are the ones on whom seed was sown among thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word and the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. You see, the word is heard, but does not live. It has competition. The thorns from seeds of meditation on the philosophies and beliefs of the world system, which say things, power, money, relationships, and fame, will bring me peace, happiness, and worth. Jesus speaks of this competition in Matthew 18, 8-9 when he tells us it is better to enter life crippled, lame, or blind than to have a complete body and be cast into eternal fire. The life here should not be taken as eternity. It is life now, certainly eternal, but it started when one enters the life of the king and kingdom that is eternal. But we will not enter into life as it is to be lived if we do not remove the competition. Another important place where we see this principle established is in the cleansing of the temple. We see Jesus enter the temple, look around, calmly sit down and braid a whip, and then very purposely, he removed the competition. Jesus' words, abiding in me, bring fruit. It is not the media's words, worldly philosophy's words, or even reading about Jesus' words that bring fruit as Jesus describes. Competing thoughts and beliefs choke the word, and make it unfruitful. So Jesus tells us that it is the closest of relationships with him and with his words that will bring fruit as he describes and desires. 
But there is one more piece to this natural progression that we have not discussed, and sadly, not just in the current treatise, but it is ignored by almost all of us in the church, organized or real, through all of history. Jesus' next statement in John 15, 7 is, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Asking is prayer, and prayer is not a religious activity. Prayer is conversation with God, not a monologue, and not done only in church or at the bedside. It is without ceasing. This always sounded so impossible. But this was again because of faulty religious definitions that I had. Conversation is not simply verbal communication, and, as already stated, it is not a monologue, and thus requires also listening. We do this very type of communication with other people all day long. We speak, listen, show facial and body language which indicates our thoughts on the subject, and then we may behave in accordance with the impact of that communication. All this is conversation without ceasing, and conversation between man and God without ceasing is prayer. Perhaps this can be pictured by an elderly couple that is still deeply in love after their many years together and very comfortable with themselves as individuals, and have that depth of communication that does not require constant words, but can be conveyed by the movement of a hand, a micro-movement of the face, unperceivable by all save the partner, a sigh in the night. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. The independent, arrogant mind of man, even those who are Christian, interpret Jesus' statement as, I am going this way, or I am doing this. You, God, are to come along and help. But Jesus did not say he would help. He said, ask, and it will be done for you. Church programs, denominations, the latest church growth fad, Paul's great learning and accomplishments, your and my great learning and accomplishments are all dung in comparison to having and knowing Christ. And none of these are the way to bear fruit, as Jesus said. Asking and allowing God to do it for us is the way in which we bear much fruit, and Father is glorified. All our fleshly efforts do bear fruit, but not to the glory of Father, but rather to the glory of mankind, church kind, religious kind. The Tower of Babel, rising to make a name above the name above all names. In the famous verse of Revelation 13.18 regarding the beast, we see stated, The number is that of a man, and his number is 666. The Greek in this sentence reveals a subtlety. There is no definite article, a, in the Greek. In other words, the phrase, a man, is not there. There are two most commonly used words for man. One is andros, which is usually used for an individual man or husband, i.e., a man. This is not the word used in this sentence. The word used is anthropos, whose primary meaning is mankind as a whole, universally mankind or man as a species. So perhaps a better understanding of the sentence is not in terms of a specific man, which may be true, but of mankind as a whole in his pride opposed to Christ's kingship in his life. We keep looking for a world leader to rise up and be the Antichrist, when it is mankind as a whole who, in his pride, in his self-sufficiency, and in his pompous assumption of the role of building the church, is Antichrist. It is mankind looking at the I am and stating, not you, I am. Antichrist is me. And there is no need to fear the phrase, whatever you wish, for anyone who lives in Messiah and in whom Messiah's words live will have his or her wishes changed from those of this world to the wishes of God. Psalm 37 4 states to delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. If you are delighting yourself in the Lord, the desires of your heart will not be for worldly things, for he will give your heart new desires, desires of and from the heart which is all love. Asking whatever you wish will not be the wishes of a worldly, double-minded, antichrist heart. It will be from a heart filled with the wishes of the true Christ. 
For according to the verses upon which we have been focused, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. The glorification of Father and the production of much fruit is answered prayer.